face up because I like to look at people's faces. If for some reason we start cracking, Alan, just send me a text and I'll uh, I'll reduce my bandwidth. Today we're talking about uh, the conclusion for this idea of perfection. All right, uh, the conclusion for perfection. We've talked about what makes a human being, the different parts, the the spiritual, the the soul, and the physical or the mind, the character. Um, we last week we talked about the importance of the mind, how we can just just as Jesus did, right? When he was born with that mind connected to God, that he could make that choice, right? That he could choose to, to have a good mind, a good character. And that we also get that. We also have that ability through the Holy Spirit to make that choice, to be good people, uh, not just in actions, but down, down in our very souls, in our minds, in our characters. Today, I'm gonna to answer the big question that everyone always kind of ends up asking. And the, the question is, can I be completely perfect here on this earth? Can I be 100% in body, spirit, and mind perfect here on earth before Jesus comes? And that's the key, right? Before Jesus comes. Uh, even before we read the Bible, I'm going to give you the answer, and then the Bible will then explain, all right? Um, and again, I'm being very specific here. Can, I, can we be completely perfect in body? mind and spirit uh, before Jesus comes back? And my simple answer is no. Uh, and I'll explain it this way. For that to be the case, 100, again, I'm talking about 100% com complete, perfect, all right? Nothing, nothing in you is, is connected to sin. That means that you would need a body that does not get tired, that does not have scars, that cannot get hurt, or hungry, or thirsty, or die? Uh, and, and I can ask you that simple question. Do you think that's possible? Do you think that you can have a perfect body before Jesus comes back? Do you think that you can attain somehow uh, a body that does not get hurt anymore, that does not get hungry, or thirsty, or die? Can you get a, um, an immortal body before Jesus comes back? Uh, and hopefully everyone has the same answer to that question and you'll understand why I'm saying no. All right. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean that we can't be perfect. All right. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. But first, I really want to emphasize the, the flesh part so that we can understand the next part. All right. So I'm going to start here in first Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, it's a verse that's taken out of context a lot of times. Let me read it here. Verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit in corruption. A lot of people read this verse and they say, whoa, wait, that means that in heaven, I don't have flesh and blood, right? Because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That seems to be what it's saying, right? When you, when you simply take this one verse, uh, and that one line, it makes it seem like maybe we're all going to be spirits in heaven, these floating ghosts or something, something that that doesn't have a physical body. Uh, and then what I want to tell you today is that that's not accurate. All right. You have to understand the context of this verse. In fact, the second part of this verse already explains it. So, yes, it says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, but they keep reading. It says, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. So by using the word corruption and incorruption, he's talking about two different types of flesh, all right? The corruption, the first flesh, that's the flesh you're born with, all right? That's the flesh that's corrupted, that's, that has corruption in it. It naturally gets old and hurt and dies, all right? But incorruption is a body that does not go through those things. It's a body that is literally perfect. It does not age. It does not get hurt. It does not die, all right? So when the verse says flesh and blood cannot in inherit the kingdom of God, Paul is specifically talking about the flesh that you're born with. So the flesh and blood that you were born with cannot go to heaven. And you have to get this in your mind. God never promised that the body that you were born with will go to heaven. That is not in the Bible. What God does promise is to give you a new body, 
a new life, an incorruptible one that can make it to heaven. And, and we can just prove it. We just have to go up a few verses, all right? Same chapter, uh, but this time we're going to start in verse 42. Look at what it says here. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, in, in, or in other words, we are born with this corrupted body in corruption, but it is raised in incorruption. So you will receive a new body, all right? If you accept Christ, if, if you make that choice to go to heaven and you believe in God and, and accept his salvation, you are going to receive a new body, all right? There's no, there's no argument here. You can't debate with God. God is not going to give you this, or God is not going to allow you to keep the same body you were born with. You have to receive a new body, all right? It is sown in dishonor. So the body that you're born with already has dishonor in it, but it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. We all can understand this, right? Our bodies are weak, but it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. That's the body you're born with, but it is raised a spiritual body. All right. That's the body that we're going to be receiving. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body, all right? And this is the context for, for, for verse 50. And in fact, if you were to jump up after verse 50, if you go to verse 51, again, looking at the full context, look at what it says here. Behold, I tell you a mystery. Everybody, every good Adventist knows this verse, right? Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, talking about death. So not all of us are going to die. And the way things are going on this earth, there's a good chance all of us are going to be alive when Jesus comes back, right? Uh, not all of us will sleep. Not all of us will die. But we shall all be changed. And this is why I'm saying it is impossible for you to get a perfect body before Jesus comes back. Because the Bible is being very clear that there is going to be a moment when everyone, everybody will be changed from that natural body to that spiritual body, all right? Uh, and then, if, again, if you read the context, it tells you very quickly. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, all right? The last trump is a direct connection to the second coming. So at the second coming, you will receive your perfect body, which will then allow you to, to achieve that complete perfection. And that's, and that's what we're getting to in a second here, right? But only at that last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. So the dead will receive their new bodies, their incorruptible bodies, and we shall be changed. Everyone that's still alive will also receive that new body, that incorruptible body. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality, all right? So the perfect body, the one that does not age or die or get hurt or get scratched or get scarred or bruised, that perfect body will only be delivered to you at the second coming, all right? So that automatically takes one out of the three out. What's interesting now is we can still achieve perfection. The biblical view of perfection, what God means when he says perfection, all right? I want you to look quickly at this car here. A lot of times on this earth, we have people that try to perfect themselves and they try to do that through the outside, right? Through their bodies. Um, the Jews were great at this, right? That's why Jesus says, you know, on the outside, you're whitewashed tombs and on the inside, you're, you know, you're dead. Um, too many times we spend most of our energy, most of our ability, most of our time trying to perfect the outside, trying to perfect the flesh part of ourselves. But think about it. We're trying to perfect the one thing that cannot be perfected. All right. You're trying so hard to perfect the flesh, which the Bible is very clear. You cannot perfect because the problem that ends up happening a lot of times is 
we work so hard on the outside. We, we work so hard on the flesh, but the inside is garbage. I mean, what's the purpose of having a car that looks like this, but the inside looks like this? Right? I mean, I don't think this thing can even start. So you have this beautiful car that won't even move. And so, and too many times Christians are so preoccupied with the outside, with the flesh, that they let their inside rot and they let their inside rust. And that is completely opposite to what the Bible says. The Bible says, work on the inside. Because the amazing thing is, and this is what we're going to learn, is when you work on the inside, it has this magical effect of also helping the outside. All right? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 58, ends like this. Again, this is all part of the context. The same chapter that we've been reading. This is the therefore. So this is his conclusion to all of those things about the, 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 the original flesh and that spiritual flesh and so on. This is his therefore, his conclusion to this matter. Therefore, verse 58, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, this is really important. Um, because what I don't want people to get out of this sermon to, is to think, well, if I can't be 100% perfect, if I can't perfect my flesh, then what's the point, right? Because a lot of people have this mentality of zero or 100. I either want to be 100% or zero. Uh, and, and what Paul is saying here is like, listen, even though you still carry that original flesh with you until Jesus comes back, the work that you do, that you should be doing here on this earth, is not in vain. All right? There is still an important work that you should be doing here on earth in terms of yourself. All right? In terms of how you should be treating and dealing with yourself. Uh, and I'll actually put in, in terms of this idea of perfection. All right? Now, the obvious question is, what is that labor then? What exactly does the Bible teach us should be our primary work? What should be our primary labor? Now, we know, uh, let's take a normal day. Let's take it just a, a human day. Let's keep religion out of it for a second. When you wake up, uh, let's say, you know, you're, you're in your 40s. You have a regular family. you got a regular job, a regular home, and so on. When you wake up, you have to decide what's going to take priority. You know, what, what's the one thing I really have to do today? In most cases, that priority will be I have to go to work, right? Uh, and when you think about it, work takes up, what, eight, nine hours of your day? If you include driving back and forth, it can go up to 10, 11 hours. So obviously, yes, work becomes, okay, this, this is my primary thing. Again, I'm keeping religion out of it, all right? The second thing is probably family right? Spending time with family, uh, making sure I, I talk to them and, I, and we grow together and we think. So that might be second. Uh, and third might be, I don't know, maybe your own health, right? Maybe exercising, maybe eating right and so on. But you know that within your regular life, there's, there's you know, a few things that are at the top, all right? If you wake up in the morning and you say, no, for me, what's important today is fishing, and I'm going to spend, you know, 14 hours of my day today fishing. Uh, you could do that maybe once in a blue moon. But if you try doing that every day, is your life going to work? You'll have maybe a week of happiness. Uh, but once you, once you don't have money for food or anything, well, I guess you can eat fish. Um, but, you know, at, at some point, because your priorities aren't straight, your, your life is going to crumble. All right? Spirituality is the same way, all right? Within your spiritual life, there's, there's, there's many things that you have to do. You know, part of it is, you know, trying to, to, to get rid of addictions, praying, reading, meditating, going to church, helping others. You know, 
all of those things are connected to, to spirituality, to are connected to your religion, uh, but realize that there still has to be the primary jobs, the things that you, you have to put more time than anything else. Unfortunately for a lot of people, that priority a lot of times ends up being physical things. You know, I got to make myself look a certain way. I got to um, act a certain way and so on. We focus a lot on the physical. That ends up being at the top of the list. What I'm going to show you today is there's something that's much more important. All right. And the Bible is going to repeat that uh, over and over again. All right. Yes, exactly. Uh, a great mind, the mind that the flesh is perishable, rottenness that won't enter heaven. Absolutely. Right. So why work so hard on something that's not going to make it? Work on the thing that is going to make it to heaven. Right. That should be the obvious answer. And that's exactly what Paul is talking about here in terms of your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So what is that labor? What is that work? Let's jump straight in. Let's read a couple of verses here. Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 and 38. Look at what it says. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the one, the first and great commandment. Usually when we look at the Ten Commandments, we think of it from a physical point of view. I cannot steal. I cannot, you know, commit adultery. I cannot murder. Those are all physical things. Jesus is being asked, what's the, what's the most important law? And notice that it's not physical. Notice that it's all in here. Look at the three words that are used. It's the same word. Jesus is using Jewish poetry here. He's repeating the same idea three times. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, which we know is the mind, with all your soul, which we know is the mind, and with all your mind, which is the mind, right? What Jesus is doing here is he's reemphasizing the point that your primary law, the thing that you have to put at the top of your list every single day is to love God. Love God in your mind, in your soul, in your heart. In other words, with your character. Let your character be something that naturally loves God. That's work, all right? You are not born with that character, all right? You have to work at that. You have to labor at that, but you can achieve. You can achieve a character that the, the mind, the soul, the character loves God. And in fact, I'm going to push it further and I'll say, if you can achieve this, if you can love God with your character, you've achieved perfection. Just think about what we preached last week. You've achieved perfection. It doesn't mean you can't grow more, and we're going to get into that. It doesn't mean that you can't grow more. It doesn't mean that you, have to, you can just stop there and, okay, I've achieved it. But you can achieve perfection if you can do this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first. This has to be at the top of the list. Let's compare that with another verse here. Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, this is when uh, Jesus rebukes Peter. Um, this is, usually we focus on the Satan part, right? Because that really jumps out at you. Whoa, he's calling Peter Satan. The more important is actually what comes right after that. All right, but look at what it says here, verses 33. But when he turned, but when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter saying, get behind me, Satan. And look at what Jesus views as having the mind of Satan or of becoming Satan. Look what he says here. For, now that word for means, I am saying this because of this. So I am calling you Satan because of this. All right. So get behind me, Satan. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. Think about that verse there for a second. 
What Jesus is saying is there is, I am calling you Satan. That's a, that's a huge thing, right? I'm calling you Satan because your mind is focused on the things of men and not on God. Compare these two verses here. The first commandment of God is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. You do that, you're following the main law of God. You are, you are connected to God. The exact opposite. If you don't put your mind on God, but you put your mind on the world or on man, or you can use whatever other word you want, basically anything but God. The second you put your mind on anything but God, you become Satan. You become Satan. Now think about that for a second. Satan was not Satan's original name, was he? You know, when you read the Old Testament, you get the name Lucifer. Lucifer became Satan. Which really means that Satan is much more of a, a title than a name. He acquired this title. The name Satan, literally the... Uh, uh, Ho Satan, the Satan, simply means the accuser, the one against God. So you can be Satan. When he looked at Peter and he said, get behind me, Satan, he meant it. He said, Peter, you don't realize it, but you're going against me right now. You have become a Satan, an accuser, someone who's against God. And I'm here to tell you today that if you set your mind on anything but God, you become a Satan, an accuser, someone who is against God. And there's only two options. You either set your mind on the things of God or on anything else, the things of men, the things of the world, the things of Satan, anything else. You become a Satan. A satan, an accuser, someone against God. Think about that. Let's look at another verse here. Hopefully my dog doesn't start barking too much. Romans chapter 8, verse 6 says this. For to be carnally minded is death. So if you put your mind on carnal things, on the things of this world, death is your future, period. There's no ands if or buts here. If you set your mind to be carnally minded, that's death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. What is life? Who is life? God. To be spiritually minded is to be godly, is, is life and peace. Is to be connected to God. I'll say it again. It's to be perfect. If you can set your mind to be spiritual and not carnal. That's what God wants from you. That's your labor that will never be in vain. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. To have a carnal mind is to be against God. That's why Jesus calls Peter Satan, the Satan, the, the enmity against God. That's literally what Satan means. So if you put your mind, if your mind is carnal, if you put your mind, if you let your, your mind be followed by your flesh, you are an enemy against God. You have enmity against God. You become a Satan. For it is not subject to the law of God nor indeed can be. The law is there. You'll see it there, right? Not subject to the law. But that's not the focus. The focus is this. This. That's what God wants from you. And we're going to see why in a second. Romans chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. I want you to look at the part that's underlined. Present your body as a living sacrifice. What is a sacrifice? 
Feel free to take it off mute here for a second. What is a sacrifice? Just in, in, in regular English terms, what is a sacrifice? Something that you have to give up. It's more than just giving up. The, the, the original meaning offering. of sacrifice. Say it again. Offering. An offering. That's right. Uh, which really goes back to the Old Testament. A sacrifice is something that is killed. That's really what it is. Uh, and, and that's why Paul specifically says a living sacrifice. So a living dead thing. Which doesn't make sense. All right. But this is what he's trying to say. Listen. Yes, you're stuck with your body. Yes, even though you can connect your mind to God. You're still carrying around this thing here. Now, this thing is sinful. It's in its DNA. You don't choose to get older. You don't choose to get bruised or hungry. It is a natural consequence because sin is infused. It is part of your flesh. So you're stuck with it. So it's always going to be alive until Jesus comes. But you can still sacrifice it. And you do that by not paying attention to it. You can do it that even though it's tugging at your sleeve, you just shrug it away. You don't let your mind go there. That is how you become a living sacrifice. You choose to see it as a dead thing. And the dead things do not affect your mind. That's what Paul is saying here. Present your bodies, present your flesh as a living sacrifice. Is it there? Yes, but you will not pay attention to it. You will not be led by it. You will not set your mind on what your flesh wants to do. That's what it means to be a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable to God. That is your reasonable service. The how you do that in verse two, all right? Verse one is what we have to do. Verse two is how you do that. And look at what it says here. And do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We keep getting back to this. It's the mind that's important. You can't transform your body. But you can transform your mind. And if you transform your mind, you can push your body to the back. Is it still alive? Yes. Will it still end up making you do things? Yes, unfortunately. But your mind doesn't have to agree with it. Your mind doesn't have to accept it. That's what Paul was talking about when he says, you know, I try to do good and I can't. And when I try to do good, you know, I end up doing bad. That's because his body is still alive and he still ends up, you know, screwing up. But he's saying, but my mind isn't making that choice. Which is why, and I put this in, in Sabbath school. I read this in Sabbath school. That is why it's no longer I who is sitting, but my flesh, my body. Because I, my mind is choosing God. That's presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice by letting your mind be renewed, letting your mind be transformed, focusing on this, the one thing that you can change, that you do have a choice for, that you can perfect. And we're going to understand what that means. All right. But let's keep reading a few more verses here. Ephesians chapter four, starting from verse 20. But you have not so learned Christ. All right. If you want to know what that means, just read a couple of verses. I, I, I Just because of time, I didn't read it. Uh, but he's talking about the Gentiles and so on. But you have not so learned in Christ. So what you learned about Christ is different than how the world teaches. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. And what is that truth? That you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt and according uh which grows corrupt and according to the deceitful lusts what 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 paul is saying here in ephesians 4 is exactly what he was saying in the other verse 
is presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice. Listen, your body is still there. Your old man is still holding on to you. You're still, it's still physical. But put it off. Ignore it. Push it off to the side. Don't let your mind be influenced by it. Keep your mind on godly things. Keep your mind on God and not on the flesh. Put off the old man. Yes, you're still wearing them, but don't listen to him. Because the old man only grows more corrupt according to deceitful lusts. So that's what you shouldn't do. Verse 23 says what we should do. And again, the exact same message. Look at what it says. And be renewed in the spirit where? Of your mind. And that you put the, the new man, which was created according to God, in true righteousness and holiness. Be a new person. A mind which doesn't just do what the body wants. And we all know what this feels like. Uh, how many times have you been driving in a car and, you know, the McDonald's truck passes by and is that big, big Mac? Or some other food, right? What's the, the, it's instinct. Your body goes like this. Oh, I, I'm hungry. Oh, I want a hamburger. Oh, I want this or whatever it is, right? You're flipping through the, the, the channels. You see a commercial and it shows you, so, oh, I want that. That's why they make commercials, by the way, you know, right? because they know that your body is strong and that your body has desires and addictions and that it, it, it has this ability to, to jump out and control you. Paul is saying, listen, you still have your body and you're going to have that body until Jesus comes back. But that doesn't mean that your mind has to accept what your body wants. Set your mind on God. You still have the body. It'll still screw you up. But your mind can be perfect with God. All right. Let your mind be renewed. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Same message over and over and over again. That's what Matthew 5 is really talking about. We talked about this verse last week. Therefore, you shall be perfect. This is your father in heaven is perfect. This is perfection of character. The Bible teaches that. Ellen White teaches that. It's perfection of your mind, of your character. And this is where this becomes really important. This is a requirement. You need to perfect your mind. You need to perfect your character. It's disconnected from your body. Don't, don't think that you know, you're, you're going to be the, that complete 100% person. That's not what I'm saying here. What I'm saying is that your mind, your character has to be perfected. And what does that perfection mean? It means that you just continually look towards God. That's it. You can grow from that. You can, you can build that connection. That's, that connection can get stronger. Your relationship with God can be stronger. But the second you set your mind on God and you can keep it there, your mind on God, you've achieved perfection. Verse five, chapter five here, verse 48. You've achieved being perfect just as your father in heaven is perfect. For those that uh, want to see what Ellen White says about this, uh, what we're going to get there into a sec in a second here, but this is the labor. All those verses that we read is the same message over and over and again. Jesus saying it, Paul saying it, the Bible saying it. It is the renewing of your mind. It is putting your mind towards God. It is ignoring, at least with your mind, your flesh. You still have it. It's still going to affect you, but your mind is set on godly things. And that will make the difference between perfection and being called the Satan, the Satan. All right. This is taken from Child Guidance uh, 161, uh, 2 and 3, point 2 and point 3. Look at what it says here. A character, and that's 
the mind. That's what we're talking about here. A character formed according to divine likeliness is the only treasure that we can take from this world to the next. This is what Ellen White is saying. There is only one thing about you that is going to heaven. It is not your body. It is your character. Your character is the only treasure that we take from this world to the next. Those who are under the instruction of Christ in this world will take every divine attainment with them to the heavenly mansions. And in heaven, we are continually to improve. So, and this is why I was saying, you can perfect your character. All that means, the, the bare minimum of that perfection is simply, my mind is connected to Christ. That doesn't mean that you can't keep growing. You, In fact, you need to keep growing because even in heaven, you're going to keep growing. And that growth is simply securing and strengthening that attachment with God. All right? Building that relationship, building that love and that trust and that faith. So even in heaven, you will continually improve your character. How important then is the development of character in this life? Mental ability and genius are not character. That's knowledge. All right? So it's not about just knowing more about the Bible. A lot of people think that is, right? If I just keep reading the Bible and know the Bible, if I can memorize the Bible, then I'm, I'm, I'm perfecting my character. It's more than knowledge. It is relationship. It's true that knowledge can develop your relationship, but knowledge by itself is not your character. All right. I knew people who memorize the Bibles and they're atheists. Knowledge in of itself is not enough. Relationship through that knowledge, having a relationship with God. All right. But let me just keep reading here. Mental ability and genius are not character, for these are often possessed by those who have the very opposite of good character. Reputation is not character. The way people see you, the actions, the way you're dressed, the way your hair is cut, uh, the way people see you, that is not your character. It can. It can be the same but it can also be faked. And that's the car that we showed you at the beginning, right? The car looks beautiful on the outside. The reputation looks beautiful, but on the inside, it's rotten. It's rusted. It's worthless. Reputation in of itself. And this is the physical part, by the way. These are the people that, that they try to fix the, the, fix the outside so that their reputation is good. But that doesn't necessarily mean your character. It can, but not necessarily. True character is a quality of the soul revealing itself in the conduct. True character is what's happening in here. It's the connection that you're making to God. And the beautiful thing, and that's what this is saying here at the end is, when you do that connection to God, do you still have your sinful flesh? Yes. But you will notice that even your actions, your conduct will begin to model what's going on in your brain. So you will become, even physically, a better person. You will have a better reputation. But the reputation in of itself is enough. That's what this is saying. Character is here. Let's read another one here. This is from the Great Controversy, uh, 664.3. In the beginning, man was created in the likeness of God, not only in character, but in form and feature. So not just in the mind, but physically as well, right? Sin defaced and almost obliterated the divine image. But Christ came to restore that which had been lost. All right. 
Now, the, the next part is what's really important. He will change our vile bodies. Remember talking about, can we achieve that perfect before Christ comes back, right? Can we have that perfect body before the second coming? Well, let's see what she says here. He will change our vile bodies and fashion them onto his glorious body. The mortal corruptible form, the void of comeliness, once polluted with sin, becomes what? Perfect, beautiful, and immortal. So one day, yes, one day, yes, we can say we are 100% perfect. But that will only happen when Jesus changes our bodies. Look at what she keeps saying here. All blemishes and deformities are left in the grave. Restored to the tree of life in the long lost Eden, the redeemed will grow up to the full statue of the race in its primary glory. The last lingering traces of the curse of sin will be removed and Christ's faithful ones will appear in the, in the beauty of the Lord our God. Again, at the second coming, notice what's changed. When the second coming happens, she makes it very clear and the Bible does the same thing. It is the body that is transformed, right? We shall, in the twinkling of eye, we shall get a new body. Not talking about our minds, not talking about our character. Our character stays the same. Remember what the previous one says? Our character is what we take to heaven, which is why we need perfect characters. So that we can be completely perfect once Jesus transforms our body. Because look at what it says here. Uh, the last lingering traces of the curse of sin will be removed and Christ's faithful ones will appear in, in the beauty of our Lord, uh, in the Lord our God, in mind and soul and body, reflecting the perfect image of their Lord. When Jesus transforms our body at that second coming, yes, we will be completely perfect. Mind, soul, body, spirit, in every aspect. But realize that at that second coming, the only thing that is transformed is your body, your character, your mind has to be perfect. And what that means, again, don't get confused by what that word perfection means. What that word perfection means is a mind that continually chooses God and not the world. A mind who says, no, I'm gonna focus my will, my choices on God and not on the body. That doesn't mean that the body isn't gonna sometimes force his way in and make you sin. We know our bodies do that. That's what Paul says when he says, I try to do good and I don't. My body ends up doing something. We know that happens. But that doesn't mean that you still can't say to your mind, well, listen, my body's doing something, but my mind is going to remain on God. And that's the perfection that God is looking for. A mind that is on God. A character that is spiritual. And that takes work. That's labor, and the labor isn't in vain. Let's pray. Let's pray, and then I'll, uh, I'll open it up to anyone that wants to say something. Let's pray. God, thank you, Lord, for being with us here today. Uh, thank you so much for the Bible, for the messages. Lord, help us to study. Help us to grow. Lord, over and over and over again, you've made it clear in your Bible that we need to have that renewed mind. We have to focus our souls, our minds, our character on you, Lord. Um, even though we still carry the old man, the sinful flesh, Lord. But I pray, God, that in our minds, 
that we can set you as the very top. As that first great commandment says, that we will love the Lord our God with all our minds and hearts and soul. That is what I desire for all of us here today. That we could give all our mind to you, to loving you, Lord. But we know that this can only be done through your Holy Spirit, Lord, through connecting to you, Lord, as we've mentioned in the previous weeks, Lord. So I pray for that. I pray that we can accept your salvation. We can accept your sacrifice, which allows us to receive the Holy Spirit, Lord, which then gives us the ability to completely focus all of our minds on you and your love. This is my prayer, Lord, for everyone here. And I pray this, God, in the greatest name of all, Lord, the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.